Hi everyone, my name is Lily and I'm the Billing and Office Manager here at Community Health Resource Center. Thank you for joining us for the second session of our Chronic Kidney Disease and Nutrition Series. Today's presentation will provide guidance on managing CKD through nu nutrition intervention. We will also include a discussion of popular weight loss drugs and their relation to CKD with nutrition tips for those who are taking the drugs. I'd like to thank our partner, the National Kidney Foundation, for helping make this series possible. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to share a little bit about Community Health Resource Center for those who haven't joined our programs in the past. Uh, Community Health Resource Center is a nonprofit organization here in San Francisco. We were established nearly 40 years ago by uh, physicians at California Pacific Medical Center to provide resources and care that would supplement their work with patients to support their overall health and well being. Today, we provide four main areas of service, including social work, nutrition counseling, community health screenings, and health education. This series is a culmination of two of our areas of service, nutrition counseling and health education. We're excited to have one of our own nutrition providers, Elena Zadaru, leading this series. Elena is a registered dietitian and the director of our nutrition team. She is passionate about working in the outpatient setting and supporting her clients achieve their health goals. She provides individualized nutrition counseling for weight loss and disease prevention, but also provides nutrition therapy for people with various medical conditions, such as cancer, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, gastrointestinal disorders, cystic fibrosis, and more. Elena also provides nutrition therapy for cancer patients going through chemotherapy at the Brian Hemming Cancer Care Center or radiation treatment at the CPMC Radiation Oncology Department on an as-needed basis. Her goal is to meet her patients where they are in terms of readiness to change and help them set goals that are realistic and achievable to promote self-efficacy and achieving health behavior change. As a reminder, the information provided in this presentation is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional medical advice. I would now like to go ahead and pass it along to Franco Reyna from National Kidney Foundation to share more about their organization. As you all know, we uh, have been uh, had a wonderful opportunity for our second year to be collaborating with this wonderful team from uh, uh, the Community uh, Health Resource Center. Uh, Lily and Elena have been wonderful partners the last couple of years, uh, so we're excited again. And you met my partner, uh, Doris Liu, uh, in the first session. And today, uh, I'm Franco Reina, uh, kind of helping her out in a, in a short way, small way. Um, and to, to just kind of give you a little bit of information and a brief uh, resource uh, opportunity uh, from our organization. Uh, we're from the National Kidney Foundation. As you all know, it's a national organization. Uh, and I think we're, this year, we're celebrating close to, if not a bit over 65 years, which is fantastic, which is telling you that we've been around for a while. Uh, so we got a lot of wonderful information uh, that we want to share with you. And specifically, uh, there are three programs that uh, over the course of the three sessions, if you have the time during the course, course uh, between one session and another. Uh, if you want to take a little time and refresh your, yourself on a particular uh, topic, there are community uh, online communities, um, different uh, uh, subjects uh, and themes and, and topics that are there uh, that you can also connect with uh, different individuals throughout the, the U.S. And then most importantly, a couple of programs that are a little bit more one-to-one -one in the sense that if you have specific personal information uh, for yourself or your family that you need, please feel free to call, contact our NKF Cares um, Information Center. It's based out of our um, New York headquarters, and you can actually connect with a live person if you uh, call within uh, normal business hours, East Coast time, nine to five. So give it a shot if you haven't uh, uh, accessed the, the uh, center and someone to talk to about anything connected to or related to diabetes. And secondly, uh, a program which is uh, functions kind of a as a um, uh, group a support group for different aspects for different topics around diabetes, including 
um, end stage kidney failure, or transplant, which seems to be a very popular uh, uh, type of conversation uh, in different parts of the country. So again, try to uh, connect with those and find out a little bit more detail with respect to those two groups of uh, which may be re really helpful in seeking information, maybe connecting with others that may be uh, experiencing similar situations with respect to their kidney health. And then if you are uh, one of those individuals that likes to learn and gather as much information about uh, health in general and, and kidneys specifically, we have our Kidney Learning Center, which is a kind of self-guided uh, part of our website where you can actually go on and, and log on and, and do self uh, video sessions with different topics, and you see some of those here uh, related to kidney disease in general, treatment options, uh, first steps to transplant, one of our programs, uh, Big Ask, Big Give, uh, different parts of it can be uh, experienced through those sessions, and you can go at your own pace. So give it a, a, a look when you have a chance. And then lastly, I'd like to kind of just uh, let you know of some of the wonderful activities that are coming up uh, as we end October and uh, close out the summer and get into the fall. As we know, most of our uh, families and kids are, are, are returning to school or have returned to school. And so in September, we have our, our next uh, kidney education piece for um individuals that are living with kidney disease and their uh, families, as well as health professionals. Um, and that is Wednesday, uh, uh, September, um, coming up in September. So please uh, log on or, or take a little um, flash of the QR code and uh, please uh, connect or call my contact uh, or contact person, Doris Liu. Um, for that information. And lastly, I'm based in Southern California. Um, so I'd like to invite you to our walk if you happen to be uh, in the Southern California area, Long Beach specifically on the weekend of September 29th. Come join us. We're gonna be right by the um, uh, aquarium of Long Beach uh, by the convention center. Uh, it's, a, it's a day that's fun filled and lots of good stuff is gonna be happening as long as raising money for everyone else. And then of course, in the fall in, in uh, November, we have our annual uh, Authors Luncheon, which is a wonderful event for us because we actually bring a group of authors. You know, some of the books that are our bestsellers, we are able and gladly uh, connect with some of the, the most popular authors to, to uh, uh, have a day of celebration uh, and not only to talk about their books uh, and their writings, but also connect that to kidney disease. So it's a wonderful event and hope you have some time to join us. And then lastly, again, uh, anytime that you feel like you need information, please go on to our kidney.org website. And there's uh, at the bottom, you can actually be specific in terms of the information and uh, resources that are available, uh, whether you're a patient, you're a medical professional, an advocate, uh, or one of our corporate partners. So um, once again, give it uh, a try. Uh, and that's it for me. I'll stop sharing so we can move on to the, what we're here for, which is the information that uh, Elena is so kindly going to share with us today. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll just take it over. Um, so uh, welcome back, everyone, for our second week of um, chronic kidney disease series. We're going to focus on nutrition today, and I'm very excited about that. Thank you for being here with us um, I'm going to just get started because we have a lot of information to cover today. Um, so we're going to talk about benefits of nutrition at any stage, dietary patterns for CKD. Um, we're going to talk about nutritional um, considerations, specifically protein, sodium, potassium, phosphorus. And I have a slide for others, consideration, uh, other cons consideration that we need to think of. And then um, the last part of presentation will um, actually cover more information about the weight loss medications, in particular, the newer um, classes of GLP-1 um, receptor agonists. So um, let's get started. Uh, I have some slides that are a little bit more dense. You're gonna receive the, uh, the slides and that information, but I have some references and I wanted to just kind of point out that definitely nutrition is beneficial at any stage of CKD. And medical nutrition therapy, actually, um, um, it's beneficial to improve nutritional markers um, and uh, delay the progression of CKD, delay the need for dialysis. Um, nutrition interventions also can improve blood glucose and blood pressure. 
um, we have evidence in more recent studies that eating more plant uh, based diet uh, on a plant based diet pattern it, it can prevent and slow the progression of CKD uh, can help ma manage better diabetes blood pressure and and uh, can also help with uh, lowering the uh, risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, we have more and more information about the plant-dominant low-protein diets, and I'll talk more about in more detail, uh, which um, de basically lowers the risk of developing CKD, delays the CKD progression, and it helps with complications um, uh, of CKD that it will include cardio cardiometabolic disease, metabolic acidosis, the mineral and bone disorders, all those things we talked about last week and um, uremic toxin gen generation. So basically can help those plant dominant low protein diets at any stage, more uh, early stages to not allow the progression, but also more later stages to delay the need for dialysis. However, unfortunately, plant-based diets are still not routinely being offered as a treatment option by nephrologists. So we're gonna share more information about those plant-based diets today. Um, the diet nutrition should be individualized. Again, some people need to control blood pressure, blood sugar if they have diabetes, if they have high blood pressure, or when they don't have and they just have CKD. Um, in terms of dietary patterns, we have different evidence. And again, I wanted to list certain things like Mediterranean diet, right, which is part of the plant-based may improve lipid profiles with uh, in patients with CKD stages one to five. Um, increased fruits and vegetable intake can decrease body weight, blood pressure, but also that net acid production. Remember, I talked about last week how animal-based products can increase that acid load uh, to make your urine more acidic, and then plant-based foods, including fruits and veggies, can actually make the urine uh, make the more alkaline urine and decrease that acid load. Um, Again, we have, uh, it's a bit redundant, but the low protein plant-based diets seem to benefit kidney health and um, uh, decrease proteinuria, CKD progression and uremic complications. And um, I wanna show you this slide that's actually from a research article that came out in November last year in 2023 and talks about the various types of plant-based dietary regimens. So when, and I wanna kind of say that the plant-based diet, sometimes people get confused and they think that plant-based means strictly vegan. And veganism, it's part of the plant-based diet because obviously it's 100% plant-based, but there are other variations and other types of diet that would be part of that plant-based. Basically, plant-based means when more than half of what you eat on a plate will be coming from plants, you know, and they're different. So it's not necessarily the foods that you eat on a regular basis, how much, right? Like how much of that animal food, you may still eat chicken and fish and let's say meat, but how much of that you actually eat on a regular basis, right? Part of your meals. So we have, those are newer terms, PLADO diet, which means stands for plant dominant, low protein diet and platform diet, which is plant-focused low-protein diet for CKD and diabetes. So basically, platform is the same as PLADO, but it's just for people with diabetes and CKD. Um, but if you look here at the description, you want to limit the protein to 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. And actually, I have more details under the protein and how to calculate and show you all. So I, I'll just kind of just mention it and as I said, we'll go in further details later. But this would be, you calculate how many grams of protein you can eat, uh, eat on this low protein diet, and then at least 50% of that protein should come from plant-based sources. And this is a bit different than let's say two years ago, three years ago, when I started this class series six years ago, we didn't know actually how beneficial plant-based is and how much that protein should be a combination of animal and plant. And we were thinking that maybe animal should be up to 80%, which right now we have more evidence and um, um, or to say that no, actually at least 50% plant-based sources of, of, of the protein that we're consuming. 
So the platform is basically the same. DASH it stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. So this was designed, this diet designed in late 90s, um, yeah, yeah, 98, I think, but um, basically it was as a way to reduce blood pressure and work uh, very well, still, still is working. And it's basically more plant-based. So it's a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, so bit high in potassium, low in sodium, and this way kind of manages um, and lowers blood pressure. Um, and because of the, the again, this emphasis on fruits and vegetables and plant-based foods, it's still part of that plant-based uh, category umbrella. Mediterranean diet, it's plant-based too, because really emphasize whole plant-based foods, um, um, and it actually limits the intake of lean meats, um, dairy, seafood, um, so any animal products, um, and basically emphasizes healthy fats as olive oil and added sugar processed foods and red meats are generally, we say excluded, but they're at the top of the pyramid, which means rarely consumed. Um, we have the flexitarian diet. It comes from being flexible with your diet. That's what I like to think of. That means you're a semi-vegetarian. You might not commit 100% to, let's say, eliminate meat um, or even animal-based foods from your diet. Sometimes you might eat them, but you're not eating them on a regular basis. You're trying not to eat them on a regular basis, but sometimes you might make exceptions and eat them. Uh, they're still taking a small percentage um, of your diet. Then we have the vegetarian diet, which can include, will exclude beef, pork, chicken, but can include, let's say, fish if you're pescatarian, can include dairy or eggs if you're lacto vegetarian uh, or just lacto vegetarian, you're eating just dairy but not eggs. So there are lots of variations of that, but that can also be part of the more plant based dietary regimen. And then we also have a whole food plant based diet, which emphasizes the consumption of whole plant based foods as opposed to refine or pl process plant-based foods, still typically limiting animal-based foods like animal proteins. But for example, those would also, um, I give this example, baked goods or you know even bread, white bread can be part of a plant-based diet, right? Because it's with white flour, but with a whole food plant-based diet, you basically consume more, like a whole wheat or whole grain type of um, uh, um, carbohydrate as, as the plant-based food, not the refined one. So you're not eating as much as um, as much um, processed food. And then the last one would be the vegan diet, which self-explanatory is 100% plant-based, so excludes completely the um, products, um, animal products. So all of those can be helpful and can be part of a low protein plant-based um, dietary pattern uh, helpful for sleep. I have here a little bit of a graphic showing that uh, when you decrease animal protein and more plant protein, how that can be helpful for your kidney health. So you're gonna get more fiber, right? Because fiber is only in plant-based foods legumes, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and nuts and seeds. Those are the five categories of plant-based foods that have fiber that can be beneficial to your gut and create, um, actually correct the gut dysbiosis, which is an imbalance in your gut. It can happen, can also decrease the uremic toxins um, and benefit your kidney this way. Um, it can also decrease intestinal phosphorus absorption because the plant-based foods, they have the fiber, they have the phytates, and those are things that bind the phosphorus and actually decrease the absorption of phosphorus in your blood. So there's less of a risk to have high phosphorus in your in your blood when your kidneys are not working properly. So decrease the risk of hyperphosphatemia, which we explained last week what it was. It can decrease the dietary acid load, which I... Um, um, I explain how that creates a less acidic urine and then can decrease the risk of metabolic acidosis, um, can decrease the glomerular hyperfiltration and basically de decrease the risk of proteinuria. So you're not getting, you're not excreting as much protein in your urine. 
and also can increase magnesium intake because magnesium is a mineral that's high, it's abundant in plant-based foods like leafy greens and legumes and whole grains and nuts and seeds. And this way you can decrease the risk of vascular calcification that can contribute to um, heart disease. So that's how uh, plant-based diet can help with CKD in general. Um, I give I have here my plate model of eating as an example, half a plate, non-starchy vegetable. This is also ideal uh, ratio on the plate when people are trying to lose weight in a healthy way. You still want to feel full. So you make half of what you're eating, the non-starchy vegetables, a combination of cooked salads, raw, doesn't matter. Uh, but the idea is those are fillers. Those are lower calorie foods that will lower the calorie density of your entire plate. And then the other half, you split it in half between a healthy starch with fiber, ideally, and a lean protein, which again, at times you could make 100%. This is 75% plant-based, right? In between the vegetable and the starch. Here, if sometimes you replace this with maybe some beans or tofu or um, quinoa and beans um, or other co combinations, that would be 100% plant-based and that can be also achieved, but this would be good enough to be um, in a plant-based dietary pattern. Now we're visiting the nutrients of concern. We're gonna take one by one, protein, sodium, potassium, and phosphorus. Um, how much protein should I eat? Um, this is a good question. Um, it's been, Low protein diets have been controversial for the last years. Uh, question of benefits, risk of malnutrition, not getting enough protein for your muscles, hard to follow and adhere to a low protein diet. Again, we need more and more and more studies, but we have enough evidence right now to kind of keep this recommendation of a plant predominant low medium protein diet, 0.6 to 0 0.8 grams protein per kilogram per day with more than 50% plant-based protein sources. Now, we have also this recommendation that you could go to a very low protein diet, which would be 0.28 to 0.43 grams of protein per kilogram per day, but with additional keto, keto acids, um, um, amino acid analogs, and I'll have a slide to explain what they are to meet the protein requirements. So the protein requirements per gram per protein per kilogram per day, it's still going to be this 0 0.55 to 0 0.6. You can go up to 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 just because, um, as I said, this is actually easier to achieve. And a lot of, um, in more random randomized controlled trials, when people were following, were studied and following those protein, actually they realized that they were eating a bit more protein than 0 0.55 to 0 0.6. So they're eating more in the 0 0.6, 0 0.8 and still had benefits. So um, the, the a big problem with the low protein diets is people don't adhere to them as easily and it takes some time to get used to it and adjust and, and kind of know how to eat this way. But this very low protein diet um, can be used with the additional keto acids, which those are basically some supplements. You know, it comes in a more powder form. It's in, under the category of medical food. And basically, it's a type of, um, um, you know, um, the type of amino acids that are nitrogen free because nitrogen is the metabolite of amino acids. So it's kind of the waste material that gets filtered by kidneys. And those, the nitrogen is the one that can harm the kidneys and put more strain on your kidneys when they're not functioning as well. So those are amino acids that would be basically uh, nitrogen free. So won't put strain on your uh, kidneys, but your body can use that extra protein for muscle mass purposes and other body functions. So um, it can be supplemented this way, basically. And then from your diet, you get very little uh, protein. Um, now, the, the, there is definitely evidence that those can show to reduce CKD progression. I have to say in terms of clinical relevance, it, it, it's just a little bit harder to, I mean, they're expensive. Not everybody have um, has access to those. 
And a lot of times, um, you know, there are an option. I wanted to kind of provide that as an information. Um, but a lot of times um, people just follow a 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Um, and it, it works pretty well overall to, um, you know, to not put more strain on your kidneys. This again, it would be an option, let's say somebody that already does this protein restriction, but they might still experience uh, progression or let's say their later stages really want to delay dialysis. So you want to kind of try uh, this. Um, as I said, unfortunately, it is less available and more expensive, uh, but overall seems to be working well. Um, so we have here, Again, for CKD stages three to five, reasonable to recommend 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 um, to help maintain a stable nutritional status and optimize glycemic control. And again, slow down the progression of CKD. In adults um, with CKD stage five on hemo or um, uh, peritoneal dialysis, the amount of protein will be higher. And I want to mention, I know we're not focusing on dialysis and I'm not going to have nutrition information for patients on dialysis, but uh, I wanted to, because sometimes people get confused and say, oh, I thought I should have more protein or I, should, I, I thought somebody on dialysis, I thought I should limit the protein, but actually somebody on dialysis needs more protein because there are losses of protein through the process of dialysis when the machine kind of filters your blood and um, and uh, replaces basically the, the kidney function. So one to 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram per day would be in that particular case what we recommend. Again, protein type, I just already told you, and I'm going to say it a few more times, more than 50% plant-based protein foods seem to be beneficial. Eating less processed foods and less meat uh, lessens also production, production of ages, which are advanced glycation and products, which are linked to the more of those we kind of make in our body, the, uh, the more CKD can progress. So they're linked with um, CKD pro progression. Um, how Ways to limit the ages production would be limiting high fat, high protein animal products, high sugar and processed foods um, before maining those foods. And especially when they're cooked with dry heat, high temperatures. So cooking with more moist, um, uh, moist heat, lower temperature, shorter time of cooking, actually you reduce the production of those advanced glycation end products that, as I said, happen in those foods. Um, sometimes also, uh, what can be helpful is to cook, um, the meats with acidic ingredients, like a marinade, right? Um, vinegar, lemon juice, tomato juice. So ma marinating the meat before cooking can help to allow less production of those ages. Cooking over ceramic surfaces like slow cookers would be a way too. Um, and then there's definitely um, evidence that eating more whole food, plant-based foods, especially the same meal, but in your diet in general, that's high in antioxidants can also um, help with, um, with limiting ages and regular exercise helps too. Steps to calculate daily protein. I wanted to show you how you calculate your own based on your current body weight. So, Divide your weight in pounds by 2.2 to find your weight in kilograms. Then you want to kind of multiply 0 0.6, which is the first uh, um, first number of the, the range for protein requirements. And you get the grams of protein to eat per day at the lower range. And then you multiply your weight in kilogram by 0 0.8 to get the upper range. So then you're going to have a range of grams of protein per day in which you kind of aim to stay. So for example, I have here a female, 136 pounds. She will be 61.8 kilograms. We multiply that by 0 0.6. That means 37 grams of protein would be the lower range. And then when we multiply that by 0 0.8, we get the 49.9, uh, 49.4. So I round it up, 37 to 49 will be grams of protein per day will be her ideal range to slow down the progression of CKD. 
I have here, and again, you're going to have those slides. I'm not going to list all of them, but I wanted to give you an example of how many grams of protein per different serving sizes of protein foods. An ounce of any poultry, fish, or meat would be seven grams. An egg is seven grams. An ounce of cheese would be seven grams. Um, then starches have protein too, but usually in a serving of starches or carbohydrate foods, we have about two grams. So they're not high protein foods, but they can add up, especially if we eat a lot of carbs. Uh, vegetables, less fruits and fats, no protein. So here we have, um, we uh, this list actually has two pages, as you could see, and basically uh, list all the, what we call protein foods, the ones that would have more protein. Cup of milk is eight, um, plain yogurt, eight. Now Greek yogurt, only in three ounces, not six ounces, it's about eight. So it's about double the amount of protein of regular yogurts. When you're trying to limit the protein um, and you have a small budget to work with because you're a petite frame and you're not very heavy, then you want to maybe use, you know, a plain yogurt, regular yogurt versus Greek yogurt. They will actually give you more protein or just eat less of it. Uh, grated cheese, quarter of a cup, seven grams. And then we have more plant-based protein foods here. Um, you know, like um, nuts and seeds, quarter of a cup, seven grams, two tablespoons of nut butter, seven grams, half a cup of beans and lentils, seven grams, tofu, 10 grams in half a cup cubed, cup of quinoa, it's nine grams, a cup of brown rice, it's about five grams. So um, because a serving of, of rice, it's about a third of a cup cooked. So in the cup, you have basically three servings of the two grams that I mentioned. Um, so it's about five, six grams. So um, I want to show you here a sample menu for 37 grams that we calculated for our woman earlier. Um, how does it look when it's more than 50% plant-based? Breakfast, three quarter of a cup of oatmeal with honey, plus or a cup of nuts, plus one tablespoon of ground flaxseed, plus one cup of strawberries. So this is entirely plant-based type of protein for breakfast. Lunch, sandwich with two slices of bread, with two ounces of tuna salad, lettuce, tomato, and mustard, mixed green salad, and an apple. And then dinner, a quinoa bowl with half a cup cooked quinoa, a cup cooked black beans, chopped cucumber, tomatoes, avocado, and a cup of raspberries. And this totals 37. Of course, it can be different too, but I wanted to show you, and this is not just more than 50, it's probably 80 to 90% plant-based, right? So you have more, let's say, if you would like to add an egg for breakfast, or um, you could kind of change things around a little bit if you... Uh, want to eat a bit more animal protein, still more than 50%. Um, I want to move to sodium, uh, the next nutrient of concern. Um, it's naturally present in many foods, um, but not in high amounts naturally. Um, salt, table salt, or any kind of salt um, can be sea salt, Himalayan, Himalayan salt, kosher. Uh, th those are major sources of sodium. Um, table salt is about 40% sodium and 60% chloride. So it's not 100% sodium, um, the table salt. And actually we have here the conversions. So in a quarter teaspoon of salt, you get, you get about 500 milligrams of sodium. A whole teaspoon of salt, it's about 2000 milligrams of sodium. And, um, I want to say that, um, of 75% of sodium in our diet comes from processed foods and restaurant eating. Um, so those are the higher sources of sodium. Um, and again, salt in general, it's used to preserve, to cook with, um, can help with flavoring the food. And it's not about not having at all sodium. Um, it's about um, how much, right? And, and trying to limit um, why we need the limit is it's a, it's a big contributor to blood pressure, um, you know, that can damage kidneys, blood vessels, as I explained last week, because um, too much pressure into those small capillaries in the glomerulus can really damage those small, um, small vessels and 
and not um, uh, allow, I mean, basically decrease the filtration capacity of the kidney. Kidneys cannot remove waste and extra fluids when um, those kidney blood vessels are damaged. And then that buildup of extra fluid in blood vessels that actually contributes to more high blood pressure. So it's like a vicious cycle. And, you know, high blood pressure can lead, especially uncontrolled, to CKD. But even having CKD and, and eating sodium, you could see how that actually can contribute to high blood pressure, even for people that may not have that to begin with. Um, so it's important to limit, um, um, I mentioned last week also sodium, um, like water and actually helps with more fluid retention. The sodium recommendations, um, in general, I said limit to 2000 milligrams or lower somewhere between somebody that really has an issue with, um, controlling blood pressure. They have CKD, they have high blood pressure, even on a medication, or couple of medications, medications they they still sometimes not have a good control of their blood pressure. I would be more restrictive and say try fifteen hundred. You know, if your blood pressure is well control overall between your diet and and medications, we could go to two thousand. Most people CKD um, that do not have blood pressure issues twenty three hundred would would still be okay. Um, and you'll see the recommendations are a little bit all over the place because it will depend on the diet and how where that sodium is coming from also. Um, on the Plado diet that I showed you earlier, the recommendation is less than 4,000 milligrams a day, which is, I mean, just saying that and not giving a more specific range can create a lot of confusion. I usually like to individualize for each patient depending on what other health picture they have. So we might be more restrictive or less restrictive depending on the needs. Um, I wanna mention that regular table salt, sea salt, kosher, Himalayan, they all kind of have the same sodium content per weight. Now, Different sizes of granules of salt, let's say in a teaspoon, you might get different milligrams because if you have um, a finer salt versus a harsher or like a, a, a bigger crystals of salt, of course, then the amount in a teaspoon would be different. But overall, if you compare weight by weight, those uh, different types of salt would be the same amount of sodium. Sometimes I have patients saying, um, well, I'm using Himalayan salt or sea salt because I think it salts better and I can use less. If that's the case, then use it because that allows you to get more flavor with less uh, salt. So that's perfect. It allows you actually to cut back on the salt. Uh, people with CKD, usually it would be a good idea to avoid the salt substitutes that like light salt or no salt because those products usually contain uh, potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride, but can be a, basically a, a very good source of potassium in a very absorbable form, which is a bit different than potassium in foods that we're gonna talk about. So not a good idea because you could then build up too much potassium. High sodium foods um, are usually the way I said, restaurant food, processed foods, fast foods, those are the main um, uh, sources of salt in the American diet, uh, most frozen foods, especially like a frozen meal that's fully prepared and you just need to in the microwave that would be high sodium. Canned foods can be or cannot be. Now you have to look and uh, read the nutrition labels. There are plenty of canned foods, let's say canned beans or vegetables that would be no salt added, um, would be labeled like that and they don't have any salt. Um, Traditionally, any canned food had quite a bit of salt, but we're doing better with that. Smoked and cured meats um, usually are high sodium. Any kind of actually, I want to say, uh, processed meat, um, if they're bacon or sausages, um, those are high, um, or even like a turkey deli that a lot of people think it's healthy because it's low fat, but it's still high sodium. Most cheeses, the process of making cheese involves so the sodium. Uh, pickles, sauerkraut, olives, those are high sodium foods. Most soups and salad dressings, uh, most commercially prepared sauces, condiments, and seasoning. 
many breakfast cereals and breads. There are breads that can have per slice about 300 milligrams of sodium. Not all of them, but some do. So the message here is always read nutrition labels and ingredient lists. That's the only way to kind of monitor the sodium you get in your diet. Sometimes you would be shocked and surprised when you check in the be a number that surprises you because that food may not taste as salty. And sometimes you're not surprised because um, you kind of knew, uh, your taste buds told you this is salty. Um, I want to show you how to read the nutrition label in an easy way. You want to start here, the serving size, because all those numbers listed on the nutrition label for those nutrients will be based on that serving size. So if you eat if you stick with the serving, you get what's listed. If you eat double, you need to double the number. If you eat half, you have the number, which um, it's very important to kind of understand what is a serving. The serving is not necessary to say that you could eat only that. The serving is just whatever the manufacturer decided what's a serving. And it's a reference point for you to know that in that amount, I get this, um, um, in that amount of food, I get this amount of sodium. So you want to check the calories, especially if you're watching the weight too, just to have an idea of how calorie dense that food is. And then you want to limit those three nutrients here, the saturated fat, the cholesterol, the sodium. But we're talking about sodium and sodium um, here, 20%. Um, sometimes people go by milligrams because if I gave you that recommendation, 15 to 2,000, milligrams of sodium a day, you know, 470 kind of makes sense. And you already figure out, oh, that's almost a third of the lower range, right? So that's quite a bit in a serving of this product. Sometimes people feel overwhelmed by milligrams, grams, numbers, big numbers. So I tell them, check the percentage and your reference point is 5% or less means low in that nutrient, 20% or more translates into high in that nutrient. So sodium 20%, you already, okay, this is a high sodium. Maybe I should look for something that has less. So this is how you go about. So let's look here at this example and two thirds of a cup of this product. I don't know what that is. I'm getting 160 milligrams of sodium, that's 7%. Okay, that's not five or less, but it's pretty close to five. So I would say it's probably a good choice. Um, in general, um, 140 milligrams, it's what translates into 5%. But, you know, depending also how much and how restrictive you need to be with your sodium, for majority of my patients, I say if it's less than 200 milligrams of sodium per serving, it's good. Even also that you're trying to eat more whole foods and not that much of packaged food. Moving forward, um, it's good to use substitutes. We all know salt. Um, it's good to help us enjoy the food and the food tastes better when it has salt, right? Like really enhances the flavor. But it's not the only, um, the only um, element of cooking that can be added to a food to enhance the flavor. So we, we could have other condiments and spices and herbs to help us with that. So you have here some um, instead of try, right? Um, so there are different salts, including garlic salt, celery salt, um, bouillon cubes, you know. And then we have things like fresh garlic, fresh onion, garlic powder, black pepper, um, low sodium salt free seasoning blends like Mrs. Dash, it's one of them, vinegar. Um, and then for sauces, again, we could do more vinegar, dry mustard, or make our own sauces and salad dressing, which will give us the opportunity to control the sodium. Cure foods, we have the fresh alternative. And for canned foods, we have, again, look at the ones that are canned without added salt. Ways to reduce sodium, avoid processed foods and when you have to eat them, read the nutrition labels and compare different brands, right? You may be able to find big variations within brands. As I mentioned, even on a sliced bread type of situation, there are breads that may have 80 milligrams of sodium and breads that have 300 milligrams of sodium. So it's a, a big variation. Limiting eating out, cook more often at home, 
you know, eating out is part of socializing quality of life. It's not about not eating at all, but keeping it more like a something, a treat and something that I do not the majority of time, um, um, but I do it just for pleasure, for socializing, uh, keep it again for more special occasions. Um, use more herbs and spices and less salt to season foods. Um, I have some examples here that I listed before. Um, we, we often want an acid finish with salt, but we can get this from vinegars and lemon juice. Sometimes that's a nice way to do it. Make your own condiments, buy reduced sodium or low sodium, no salt added, even better. The reduced sodium ones, you still wanna rinse them in water a bit because um, you could get rid of um, extra sodium um, even more. It's not very clear percentage wise. I mean, the studies that show that there's definitely going to be a reduction. So you can get rid of extra sodium by rinsing a canned food. Um, but how much is it's a bit of a, a question mark for now. I want to move on to potassium. Um, if you remember for last week, keeps a normal water balance. It's one of the electrolytes and helps with muscle contraction. Um, which um, that's the problem. I mean, our heart is a muscle and um, when we have too much potassium or too little potassium in our blood, that can actually affect our, um, our um, um, the way our, our heart contracts and can create arrhythmia, so irregular heartbeat. Um, kidneys remove excess potassium. And as I explained last week, in CKD potassium may accumulate creating this arrhythmia can increase the risk of heart attack. So it's obviously not a good thing to have that buildup of potassium in your blood um, when the when um, your kidneys are not able to excrete it properly. You wanna check with your doctor about what is a safe potassium for you. Um, you know, for most people, basically more than five point five would be dangerous. Um, five to 5.5, you need to be more cautious um, and safe would be 3.5 to 5. So those are levels of potassium in your blood. When potassium is high, you need to be more cautious with portions of high potassium foods. You may need to limit at one point to less than 3,000 milligrams a day. So this is something that's a big of a, a, a bit of a change compared with other years in terms of recommendations. Um, because, you know, typically we're more restrictive with dietary potassium for patients with CKD just to prevent that. But the evidence, um, kind of get here a little bit. Um, we don't have um, a lot of evidence to support the benefits of lower potassium diets. There are also some limited over observation data that shown weak association between that potassium and serum potassium levels. Um, now, there's another study that show like restricting those heart healthy fruits and vegetables that are high in potassium um, actually could potentially have negative effects on the cardiovascular health and survival of patients. D. Um, there was another uh, basically retrospective analysis, so NHAYS, those are big national examination surveys. Um, thousands of people are enrolled and um, basically they shown that um, when people had low potassium and low fiber because they're not eating all those plant-based foods, they had higher death risk versus the ones that had high potassium fiber consumption and those were in participants with kidney dysfunction. Um, and then we have other options nowadays too, like those novel potassium binders that may allow to liberalize the dietary potassium and people, allow people to eat more plant-based and take the binder so they're not accumulating too much potassium in their, um, in their um, blood. Now I wanna go back to here. Other uh, There are other causes for high potassium. 
that are not diet related, like blood pressure medications, uncontrolled diabetes, acidosis, chronic constipation. Some diuretics like furosemide, Lasix can decrease the potassium. So that means also if you're on those medications, you could eat more potassium because they excrete um, potassium, right? They help with excretion of, of potassium a bit more. And then basically the message is like, if you really have high levels of potassium, first of all, a lot of people on CKD different stages may not have high levels of potassium when they do labs. But let's say if you are in the category that, that you have high potassium, you want to check with your doctor for any other possible causes before restricting even further your diet. And restricting actually, again, those foods that would be beneficial to slow down the CKD progression, those plant-based high potassium foods mainly. Um, you know, you could absolutely enjoy moderation. Again, I'm not saying to have three, four bananas a day, but you could have some avocado, banana, cantaloupe. Those are all high potassium foods. And I have those lists with some fruits that are high potassium, vegetables, other foods like beans, meats, fish, milk, yogurt, nuts, and dry fruits. Of course, if you're diabetic, you need to be careful again with portions of dry fruits in particular. But in general, everything in moderation could still fit your diet and you don't have to be super restrictive with those healthy high potassium foods. Of course, with meats and fish and chicken and, and dairy, so those that are more animal-based foods because also you want to limit the protein. So those are going to be the high potassium foods that I would say limit the most because you want to keep the protein under um under a certain level and to make it more plant-based, more than 50%. So that means you really don't have a lot of room for those meats, fish, milk, yogurt that are also high sources of potassium. But the plant-based ones, I would be less restrictive with. Um, I want to also make a point, the fact that um, there's different bioavailability of potassium in different foods. That means in fruits and vegetables, only about 50, 60%, so about roughly half uh, of the potassium is absorbed. In the animal products, about 80%. So it's a higher absorption that typically seems to be the case with iron too, with different minerals in our body. So in the plant-based foods, because of those phytates, um, th those minerals bind with the phytates in plant-based foods and get excreted. So you're not absorbing as much in your blood as in an animal product. There's no fiber and phytates that can bind and then you absorb more of it. And then 100% of potassium in processed food is actually uh, absorbed. So that's why I said no to salt substitutes because it's, yeah, they're highly absorbable and they're concentrated in potassium. The same with some food additives and preservatives that have potassium. Trying to limit those the most. Plant-based diets, um, plant, the plant-based diet has more fiber. Um, I just kind of explained that, how um, can increase the intestinal potassium excretion. And basically, plant-based diet is not necessarily considered to increase the risk of hyperkalemia as, as um as we know uh, right now, and it's been shown, even though, as I said, historically, we were reducing all those high potassium foods um, with just more research has been shown that it's really not, um, not the best strategy. Um, again, unfortunately, especially if you go and Google online, you may still have like, you can have this fruit, you can have peaches, you can have banana, you can have avocados. I mean, it can be very confusing and overwhelming. We talked about that and now we could move to phosphates. I'm trying to have more time for questions because I know you have a lot of questions. Um, and um, I um, probably will, will still have at least 20 minutes um, left for questions. So I wanna move to phosphorus. Um, which is one another nutrient of concern and can build up in your blood if you have CKD. Um, as we talked earlier, hyperphosphatemia is, is that condition. Um, the role of phosphorus builds healthy, strong bones, um, very simplistic. Um, kidneys remove excess phosphorus, but in CKD, phosphorus can accumulate. And I talked last week about 
high phosphorus, low calcium, how that actually um, triggers that secondary para, uh, para uh, hyperparathyroidism, which is the condition when you pull calcium out of your bones and increase basically calcium in the blood, but also you weaken your bones because you're losing that calcium. So it is important to keep a good balance of phosphorus. Um, now, for patients with CKD, a good range for phosphorus is 800 to 1,000 milligrams a day. can be an individualized approach, but what I want to also um, emphasize is that when you're following a low-protein diet, you're kind of limiting the phosphorus. A lot of high-phosphorus foods are actually protein foods. Um, can be animal protein, most of them, but also some plant-based protein. So if you want to simplify the diet and say, well, I'm going to focus on lowering that protein because that seems to be important and not put more strain on my kidneys, you kind of feel reassured that the phosphorus is not going to be excessive either. SGFR reaches 15 um, ml per minute. Um, phosphate binders may be necessary. Um, so those are also very similar as um, potassium binders. They, they're basically prescribe and they can be taken with meals as a way to when you eat the food, the phosphorus in the food can bind with those phosphate bind binders and can um, basically decrease the absorption in your GI tract and pre uh, uh, prevent the absorption in the blood, sorry, by binding and excreting the phosphorus um, in your colon. Sources of phosphorus, the diet, as I mentioned, those are your protein foods, a combination of animal-based, but also nuts and beans and peas. Whole grains also are higher in phosphorus compared with the white alternatives, chocolate colas, um, so dark um, dark colas. And, um, and basically the naturally occurring phosphorus in foods, they have the organic phosphorus and um, basically in a plant-based phosphorus, plant-based phosphorus in foods will be less absorbable than animal-based uh, phosphorus. And again, in, uh, in naturally occurring phosphorus in food, if it's animal or plant, it's about 40 to 60%. And the one that's um, um, Part of the food additives are actually absorption. It's about 90%. So um, any kind of food additives that have the word phos or phosphorus, um, those are highly absorbable. And those are the ones that I recommend to um, try to avoid. We'll have next week more information about sodium and phosphorus in a more useful way in the sense that like what to look for the nutrition label, how to look for those even for sodium and what kind of names salt or sodium comes because sometimes it can be hidden on an ingredient list. Um, so we'll talk more about that next week. We'll revisit and we'll get more in details about those. But for now, just to know that basically processed foods with phosphate additives would be way worse than naturally occurring um, phosphorus in foods. We don't want to reduce that much. And then even within that category, we want to reduce more the animal. So because we want more than 50% um, plant-based protein. And then basically the message is your dry beans, beans, whole grains, and nuts would be the last to really limit from your diet. I would still keep them part of my diet, get the binders and kind of see how you're doing without without having to completely restrict them. Other nutrition considerations. Calcium, um, you know, you want to make sure you have enough calcium because with CKD, sometimes you could do low or high calcium blood levels. And uh, you don't want to exceed 2,000 milligrams of calcium per day. That can increase the uh, risk of um, blood vessel calcifications. An increased risk of heart disease. Um, some studies show that 800 to 1,000 milligrams of calcium is a good goal for people with CKD stages three and four who are not taking active vitamin D. Usually for regular populations, we say 1,000 to 1,200 um, milligrams of calcium a day 
uh, depending on the age. Um, so somewhere between 1,000 to 1,200 calcium from both diet and supplements um, would be a good amount. Vitamin D, as we know uh, from last week, uh, kidneys activate vitamin D and patients with CKD can have an increased risk of vitamin D deficiency because the kidneys cannot activate vitamin D. You have to test your vitamin D supplement accordingly. Um, if calcium in your blood gets too high, you need to stop the vitamin D supplementation. As I mentioned last week, some people need to get the active vitamin D type of supplement since... Um, um, since with the regular supplements, you you still need to activate that in your kidney. And then anemia, um, that's another nutrition consideration, but um, we talked about the erythro erythropoietin hormone that stimulates red blood cell production. So you want to, as a CKD patient, you want to kind of check for anemia, test and treat accordingly. Um, What else should I know? There is no one diet that is right for everyone with kidney disease and kidney failure. Again, it can be um, pretty much individualized. I gave you some general guidelines, but as I said, even with the sodium, sometimes I work more individualized to really create a, a, a good level or like a, a target level for each person. Um, when you can or if you cannot eat may change over time, depending also on how much kidney function you have and how you respond to diet, to treatments, um, if you have diabetes or heart disease or other conditions. So um, that's why it's very important to talk to your healthcare team, work with a dietitian. Um, I think it's, as I said, sometimes those general guidelines may not fit your needs 100%. And now the last part of the presentation, I want to talk to you about the weight loss medications um, that are more popular and effective um, um, in the last few years. Uh, those are the GLP-1-RA, uh, basically it stands for glucon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist. Basically, those medications, they mimic the effect of the GLP-1 hormone that our body, particularly our guts, it's after eating. And so our body makes this GLP-1 hormone um, and after eating secreted and what it does, this hormone, it helps secrete more insulin from the pancreas and that will help us lower blood glucose after a meal, prevents more glucose from going into the blood. Um, so you're not getting as much glucose into your blood because it blocks the glucagon secretion. Glucagon, it's a hormone that raises blood sugar. So glucagon and insulin kind of work um, the opposite way. The glucagon raises your blood glucose. And sometimes we need that if let's say we skip a meal and we need something, we need some blood in our, um, some sugar in our blood. And then insulin is the one that after a meal helps lower your blood sugar. Um, so those medications, secrete more insulin, suppress the glucagon so you're not getting too much glucose. Low gastric emptying, which means less glucose is released in, the, in, in your blood at one time. Um, so this delay gastric emptying means that it takes longer for the food to empty your stomach and the whole digestion process is delayed, um, which can space the amount of sugar that's released more in time. Increased satiety, which that happens also with a slow gastric emptying, you just feel basically the food stays longer in your stomach, you feel full for longer. But also the GLP-1 um, uh, agonist affects area of the brain that produces um, process hunger and satiety. So can regulate that. Um, and those are the types of GLP-1 medications. And some have been around for a longer time, like this uh, Bieta here, ex Exenatide. Um, sorry, I can't find my my. Okay, it's here. So Bieta. This has been approved by FDA back in two thousand five. Um, so we have the dulaglutide, which is trulicity, Exenatide, Bieta, Exenatide extended release, Durion, um, Liraglutide, Victoza, Lixisenatide, Adlixin, 
And then we have the semi-glutide injections. Those are Ozempic for diabetics and Wegovy for weight management. Those approaches for weight management, not for diabetics. Um, so those are the semi-glutides and those are the newer uh, GLP-1 medications. There's a tablet form of semi-glutide, Rebelsos, and then the newest, newest are, um, um, medications are the dual GLP-1 and GIP. So they are GLP-1. They have the GLP-1 hormone basically agonist, but they also have the GIP, which is glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, which is a type of hormone also in our body, very similar in action with the GLP-1. Increases insulin secretion, increases satiety, can actually is the makes the insulin more sense, uh, the cells more sensitive to insulin. Um, so it it's almost like a helper of GLP one, right? So it's like a double effect here. Um, and those so those dual GLP one GIP, um, they're called tyr uh, tyrosepatide and um. In that category, we have Monjaro for diabetics and Zepam that's approved just for weight. And I think those are the, the basically latest ones um, in the GLP-1 category. Um, potential benefits of those GLP-1 agonists um, definitely can lower your blood glucose, can lead to weight loss because again, you feel full for longer with less food that decrease satiety and decrease gastric emptying can help with food intake, not eating that much. Reducing risk of heart disease and kidney disease, um, improving lipid disorders, improving fatty liver, lowering blood pressure. And there are definitely some studies that are over the last couple of years showing that can slow the progression of diabetic CKD. Um, and it looks like may protect the kidneys by reducing albuminuria, reducing blood pressure, slowing the EGFR decline, and decrease the inflammation caused by um, ages. Um, now, of course, we need, we're going to have more studies to look into, but the studies that are available so far in the past couple of years um, really show benefit of, on patients with C. And that's why we decided to just kind of bring this again, may not be something that any CKD patient needs, obviously, but if you have diabetes and you, you struggle with controlling it, managing it, if you are overweight and you struggle with weight loss, um, definitely I would talk with my doctor to see if um, those medications can be an option for me, right? Possible potential side effects, right? More common loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. This is something that we hear more often. I mean, again, the decreased appetite is the way I explain how they work. You could see how you're not hungry that often that much um, with that delayed gastric emptying. The same nausea comes from there because if you have um, this delay gastric emptying, you can feel a bit more nauseated. Um, think about an example is how you feel. It's when you had a fatty meal and that actually a lot of fat in a meal can delay the gastric emptying. So, and then you feel a bit nauseated because of that. Uh, vomiting can be more severe. I mean, more not something that's expected. Most people that are on those medications definitely say their appetite is not, they're not hungry much, um, feel a little bit of nausea, um, not something to be very bothersome. But if you have a lot of nausea or vomiting, I would talk with my doctor because there are some rare cases in which, um, and I had only one patient so far that experienced that where you have more symptoms of gastroparesis, which is almost like a paralysis of your stomach when your stomach really doesn't move to turn the food, kind of just the food sits there and there's no movement. And that can help make you very nauseating and, and um, vomit. So had a gentleman in that category, he tried both truly city and Ozempic and he could not tolerate any of them. And uh, he had actually a gastric empty test that showed that it was a, 
big delay in his gastric emptying, more than what you expect or want, and made him basically not tolerate the medication. So it was concluded after two trials of different kind of GLP-1s that those are not for him. Uh, again, not very common. And diarrhea, it happens with some people, it seems to be more um, uh, at the beginning and your body adjusts to it, not like a permanent and um, more episodic too and linked with what you ate. Some of my patients were saying, oh, if I eat greasy foods or fry foods, I get diarrhea. And, you know, it's linked with the amount of fat they're eating. Less common would be indigestion, headache, dizziness, increased heart rate, infections, not as common, but there are definitely some severe side effects. They're, they're rare, um, which is good, but they can happen. Pancreatitis, thyroid cancer, good kidney injury, and worsening of diabetic retinopathy. Um, so those are rare, but more serious side effects. Again, maybe not the best choice for it any any person for everybody um eat so i wanted to give you some nutrition tips for people on glp1 uh, agonists um so if you're on those medications and you want to maximize their effect on your health the weight loss the blood sugar control ideally would be to um to adjust your diet right that you want to eat more protein um helps with fullness, with maintaining muscle mass, and trying to choose lean protein, because again, fatty proteins, fatty foods in general can make you feel more nauseated and get diarrhea and all those side effects. So choosing lean protein foods like chicken, fish, shellfish, beans, tofu, low-fat, non-fat berries, such as Greek yogurt or others, you know, those are just some examples. Um, eat mainly whole foods. Avoid processed foods as much as possible. Eat more fiber. Again, um, fiber foods are the plant-based foods, as I mentioned, whole grain, fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, and seeds. And that can help with, um, again, um, benefit more the fullness and the satiety feeling. You want to limit processed foods, fried foods, refined carbohydrates, added sugar, sugary drinks, and alcohol. Um as I said, those foods tend to aggravate uh, the symptoms and the side effects. Uh, drink enough fluids helps with hunger and nausea. Um, and eat regular meals and smaller, more frequent as needed to control for hunger. But I want to emphasize the need to eat regular meals because I had um, some patients that after starting those medications, they really feel like I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry the whole day and I'm eating in the evening one time a little bit because I know I need to eat. That's not really a good healthy eating pattern, right? And you want to get into the habit. Also, obviously, you're not going to get adequate nutrients and all that weight loss that's going to happen. It's going to be in an unhealthy way. So you still want to eat regular meals. You might eat way less, definitely. That's the purpose of taking this medication. That's how it works. It makes you eat less and that's how you lose weight. But you really want to eat regularly and, and keep that regular eating pattern. Um, one of the last slides are about the observations from my personal experience working patients on LP1 agonists. So there are not a magic pill for sure. I don't see it working uh, regardless in every single person, you know, I would say it helps most of my patients. Um, it can definitely have results, but unfortunately I had some patients that had to stop because it really didn't help them much with the weight loss. Um, so there's no magic pill and you still, I mean, the diet, the lifestyle, the exercise still matters in order to have the results, in order to feel good and tolerate the medication properly you still need to make adjustments to your lifestyle. So it's not like a magic bullet type of thing. Um, I see the most, it helps the most, the people that used to experience hunger throughout the day. They always told me, I'm always hungry. I'm thinking about food nonstop, almost like it's an obsession, right? And it's very tiring um, to think about food all the time, right? And But now they said they started those medication and they, they Basically, the food noise quieted. That's what they tell me, a lot of them. I don't have that food noise. 
I actually can eat only three times a day with, and I'm not thinking about it all the time. So for me, actually, those are the patients that benefit the most. And I, it's very nice too, because before as a dietitian working with someone that tells you I'm always hungry, I can't stop about thinking about food. Tough. It's time. To, it's very tough to talk about you know, three times a day or maybe four with a snack and controlling portion and not grazing. It's it's really tough to implement those healthy behaviors when you have that food noise. Um, another observational thing is that they don't help as much my emotional eaters. So people that uh, have tendencies to comfort with food, um, that being the first the main coping mechanism it just they don't get as much help because unfortunately they still get cravings um i would say that majority of them may say eh, they might not be as often um then i might be as intense i could maybe distract myself i can use all those strategies that we talk about so in 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 the end it's, it's it probably helps to some extent but it's not going to eliminate completely that emotional eating um and um, just want to explain the emotional eating is the eating when you're eating not because you're physically hungry, but because you feel in a certain way. Um, and it's it's basically a, a fake type of hunger. Um, and um, the last one was what I said earlier, eat regular meals at least three times a day um, can be smaller, but do not skip meals and try to keep like a more healthy eating pattern. And I have some references here, and that's the concludes uh, the presentation. We have about ten minutes only left for questions, so we're gonna just get started. Thanks, Elena. That was great. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and hop into the first question. Um, is any portion of kidney disease, for example, stage three A, reversible or improvable? Uh, including GFR or creatinine levels? Yeah, um, so definitely there are going to be improvements in the um, GFR, and, and um, but not reversible to the point that I think I said last year, last year, last week. Um, so if you have a GFR of, let's say, 40, you know, you might improve it to the 50, but it's not going to bounce back to 80 or 90 or 100. So CKD is irreversible compared with the acute kidney um, injury that you could just bounce back to whatever you were baseline 190. Um, so they're going to be definitely an improvement, but not complete um, reversible. Thank you. Is, Q is current IBW or ABW used for protein calcul intake calculations? Yeah, that's a good. It's a good question. We talk about body weight, um, so kind of your current weight, not ideal body weight, not adjusted body weight. Um, and I sometimes I have my own, um, you know, way of wondering, right? Because I don't seem to find very clear black and white type of, <laughs> um explanation of that um i still i use just current weight however i'm more careful if somebody is bmi is really high so their current uh, weight is on a higher uh, level i try to do an adjusted body weight just to make sure you know you're not feeding more the body fat than than the muscle mass um so i i still that's why as i said sometimes if it's not black and white, it's good to t talk with a professional because I, I still use the adjusted body weight, but usually just in cases when, um, um, you know, the, the current weight is, um, is over a certain amount of BMI. So more in the two classes of obesity, two and three. Great, thank you. Um, I have quite a few questions about protein, so I'm gonna kind of group them together. Um, can you talk about protein powder supplements for protein intake as well as plant-based protein options? I know you talked about this during the presentation, but if you don't mind reviewing. 
Yeah, so it it can be used, um, and especially if it's a more plant based. Um, you know, it's a little bit. Well, since you need to limit the protein, I always kind of talk with my patients and say you really want to use. I mean, protein powders usually are used to supplement protein when when you actually cannot eat that much protein in your diet and you need more for different reasons, right? So, I would say, and that there's still a more processed. Food, right? Because it's not like a whole food that it's extracted from foods and more processed um, and more concentrated. And I really, I mean, it's not that you cannot use it, but I would say I would see it a little bit more in what kind of situations would I use it? Because I want to encourage my CKD patients that have a low budget for protein, use that protein for whole foods, because as you could see, it adds up in a day. And when you eat a protein powder and in a scoop, you get 20, 25, 30 grams, that could be more challenging for you to stay within a budget, right? Um, uh, overall, I would say there's not, my, not much research that talked about like animal versus plant. I would assume plant would be better, right? Like let's say it's a pea-derived uh, pea type of protein powder. However, there were some studies a couple of years ago on those plant-based proteins about how they tend to be more contaminated with different heavy metals, which is kind of scary in a way, but um, I haven't seen much since then. I know we need more studies to show, but I usually still think of them of more like not whole foods, a bit more processed and do we really need to use them? When we really need to use them, they could be helpful. But I would say if you don't need to use them, you'll be better off with just protein from whole foods. Got it. Thank you. Um, if a person has normal potassium levels, can they continue potassium containing foods, including salt substitutes? I know you touched on this already, but if you don't mind reviewing again. Yeah, so I would say definitely, yeah, you don't need to restrict the potassium. Now, with the salt substitutes, I would be just more careful because, and be aware how much potassium, because per serving, it can be quite a bit, I think, 2,000 milligrams or so. Maybe I'm mistaken, but I know they're concentrated. So, as, and as you saw in my slide, 100% of that, so it's highly absorbable, and I would still probably not use that on a regular basis uh, as a sole subs. But high potassium foods, for sure, I would not restrict. Great, thank you. Um, are there any cookbooks or resources with kidney-friendly recipes that you might uh, be able to share about? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'll probably compile some, a uh, little bit of a resource and share that for next week. Um, on top of my, I mean, I usually redirect my patients to use the kidney.org. They have lots of recipes and information and now specific cookbooks. Um, nothing on top of my, my head that comes that I would say I highly recommend this type of cookbooks. I know a lot of people nowadays prefer also websites, but I will, um, as I said, compile a, a, a resource for um, web resources and cookbooks um, for, for next week to share. Awesome, thank you. Um, this next one, we've talked a lot about protein, but the question is how can one balance protein and calcium requirements uh, with CKD and osteopenia? Maybe we can focus more on the calcium. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> You know, we need adequate protein to protect the bones. It's true. And um, again, that 0 0.6, 0 0.8 will provide what your body needs. I mean, I just want to let people know that the regular, I mean, the recommendation for healthy individuals would be 0 0.6 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. We tend to eat more protein that we need for the body purposes and function, which again, if you don't have CKD, then make is not going to affect your health in a negative way and you could use higher protein intake but um overall i want to say that even on this 0 0.6 0 0.8 you get enough protein to protect your bones it would be more important to make sure you have adequate vitamin d in your blood so you can absorb the calcium that you're eating and taking as a supplement 
and then focus on getting enough calcium, right? Like if you are um, um, a male or female under 51, if you're a woman under 70, if you're a man, you need about a thousand milligram of calcium a day. If you're a woman over 51 and a man over 70, you need 1200. And then ideally is to get more from your diet. Uh, I mean, at least 50-50, right? Some people, because it's hard to get everything from your diet, especially in a plant-based, right? Um, because the most concentrated food sources of calcium are the dairy products, which are not plant-based. Um, there are other plant-based foods that have calcium, but they're not as concentrated. So you would have to eat a lot to get what you need in a day. So a lot of times people get about half of what they need in a day, either 500 or 600 milligrams in a supplement. And then the other half, they kind of in between one or two uh, servings of dairy products a day and what you gather from other plant-based foods. Most of us, if we eat a good um, variety of plant-based foods in a day, you could get about, uh, gather about 250 milligrams of calcium. Um, and, you know, random foods like almonds, oranges, and leafy greens and broccoli can have um, calcium and you could gather that amount. So 50-50 would be probably the easiest way to do it. So then you ensure having enough calcium in your diet so your body does not need to break down the bones from your uh, from your uh, the calcium from your bones to have enough calcium in your blood great thanks elena um next question is it best to eliminate red meat from the diet for ckd patients and what other healthy food options should ckd patients consider uh, so I don't think you have to completely eliminate and never have red meat in your life for sure. But definitely limiting and, and not making it your main choice for protein would be a good idea. Um, right? Sometimes people say I may have it once a couple of times a, a month um, or, you know, to that frequency for me is definitely not not um not too often right um now it depends i always and and i mentioned that at the beginning in my description i always do that i always meet people where they are and let's say if you're the type of person that eats red meat every day right now even once a week twice a week even like eating 12 ounces a week would still be a, a huge decrease in your regular pattern will still make an impact and sometimes you might start with that just if you the same with sodium if you eat i gave you those numbers if you eat four thousand or more milligrams of sodium a day when you estimate and think about it like even if you cut back um you know let's say you eat six thousand if you cut back fifty percent that's still at three thousand you're not a goal but it will impact your health in a positive way um, and slowly and gradually, as your taste buds adapt to less sodium, you'll be able to get into the range you need to get. Sometimes, again, the changes need to be more gradual. And whatever you can cut back and do better, those are just references that I give to people because some people can achieve them for some can be overwhelming. But that doesn't mean by cutting back and even though you're outside of the range, that cannot be beneficial for you. That would still make a, a impact and will kind of help you to be closer to where you need to be. Great, that's super helpful. Thanks, Elena. And we are at time. So like I mentioned, I will save all of the remaining questions and add them to the Q&A for next week, which is the final session of our three-week three chronic kidney disease and nutrition series. Uh, we hope to see you all there. That's next Thursday, August 29th, 3.30 to 5 p.m. And you'll receive, uh, if you're already registered or you're here, you will uh, receive another link to join next week. Again, I really appreciate you all joining us. Thank you to Elena for taking the time out of your busy schedule to present on such an important topic. And thank you to National Kidney Foundation for partnering with us and making this presentation series possible. I hope everyone has a great evening. We'll see you next week.